This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. We all be is honored to have on sister Angelique Latham, very passionate young lady, brilliant, beautiful young sister who has a passion for our people and for informing our people. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing okay, at least for now. Um, <laughs> yeah, like you said, my name is Angelique. I'm currently in college trying to figure out my life, but yeah. Welcome to the club. Everybody trying to figure out what's going on, uh, you know, purpose driven life and stuff like that. So, uh, why, why are you? What do you study in college? What, what, what are your interests? Okay, so technically, I'm on two different tracks. So, um, I guess I'm on the pre law track, but to be honest, I'm not really interested in. Well, I'm not as interested in law as I am in the entertainment industry. I have more of an interest in like writing for movies or possibly directing movies and writing books as well. And like, I have a specific interest in coming up of black kids and black young adults. You said coming of age stories concerning black kids and young adults. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So who are your inspirations uh, for that, you know, type of creativity? That track. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I can't think of anyone specific when it comes to movies, but I can tell you how the idea kind of came about. So I would say it kind of started my freshman year when I was taking a lot of classes. There was this one class in particular. It was about um, slavery. We would read like slave narratives. Um, we saw some of the, I'm not sure what they're called, like the records of like the different slaves that were sold and like, you know, what the masters had named them, their price. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, you know, why some slaves were um, sold for a lesser amount than others and like how age factored into it, how age factored into it, gender, all of that stuff. And then I remember sitting there thinking like, hmm, what would it be like, you know, to be like a young kid during this era? Or, you know, like, what would it be like to, um, like, for example, we talked mm -hmm. about Nat Turner, and how he was when he was younger he actually used to play with like the master's children or whatever but you know like when they get to a certain age they get separated because you know um they feel like the children of the masters they have to learn to you know eventually take on that position and um the slaves they felt that it wasn't really appropriate for them to be um, interacting with each other as much as they were going to be slaves and the white children were going to be masters who owned them so i started thinking about that and i was like you know like what would that actually like what would it feel like like as a black person to you know you you've been playing with these kids when you're like three or four or whatever then when you get a couple of years older now all of a sudden you know they're starting to treat you differently. And I just kind of started imagining, like, I don't want to say like, creating a movie in my head, but like, I was kind of, you know, imagining like, what would that actually be like? So that's how I kind of started. And I know I was watching like a lot of historical movies and stuff like that, like, you know, 12 Years a Slave and things of that nature. But I guess the thing with that, and I don't know how to say this per se, but I felt like a lot of slave movies, they tend to be from the perspective of older adults, I would say. There aren't a lot of um, a slave movies that I felt like focused on like young adults. I just felt like there weren't really a lot of narratives that were told from that. So that's how I started to get an interest in that. And then another class that I took, it was African American History and Theater. That's when I started learning about arts. Even though like its main focus, we focus on movies um we would read screenplays we would read um you know like actual plays uh playbills i think that's what they're called we would read um mm -hmm. you know some books and different stuff like that and that's when i started to really um learn about you know african-american co contributions to the arts outside of like the mainstream people that everyone knows like you know beyonce and jay-z you know outside of that um some of the people that we had read, we read like Audre Lorde, like a lot of her poetry. We read um, August Wilson, if you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. One of his speeches, uh, The Ground on Which I Stand, that definitely stuck with me. 
Um, we yeah, we read some of his plays, just a lot of different people, screenplays of a lot of prominent movies. Some of the names aren't coming to my head. So that's when I really started getting interested in it. And then I would say um, I started watching like a lot of interviews and stuff of like Asa Ray and, you know, other like Ava. Um, how do you say her last name? Yeah, Duvernay or something like that, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I don't know how to say her last name. <laughs> well, we know um, you talk about the camera lady. Right, yeah, 13, yeah, or like yeah. Lena Waif and stuff like that. And, you know, because mm -hmm. they're very like conscious people, you know, they're talking about, you know, black narratives and the media, different things like that. So that's how that started. Segwaying into, like you said, the main topic of discussion, you know, it's kind of heavy and dark. It's not kind of this heavy and dark and uh, disturbing. It's the, the case, the sad, tragic case of Terrell Peterson. I know, I say you know a lot about it. You're very passionate about the case. And uh, it happened, what, 22 years ago? He died 22 years ago, January 15th, 1998, I believe. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. It was January 15th, 1998. I believe it was. Okay, I'm making sure because I know it's like, you know, they love, people love, like, kids a black man having his. Oh, right. They're going to be like, oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> incorrect. In <laughs> you're just five years young. Can you tell us about the case, man? Why are you so passionate about it? And what we need to know? Like about this case. Yes. So I'll try to get like the big picture of kind of what happened. And keep in mind, you know, I this is from the perspective or interpretation of a person who is an outsider. I'm not directly related to him. You know, I don't know any of the people that were directly involved. I am basing everything that I say off of the articles that I have read. So I just mm -hmm. want to make that disclaimer. Um, okay. So Terrell Peterson. Originally, um, he was born to a woman who was addicted to crack, okay? Mm -hmm. So while he was in her womb, you know, she was, she had a drug habit. Um, when he was born, you know, and up, I would say maybe like one or two or three, because, you know, he had other siblings too. He had a sibling that was older and a sibling that was younger. His mother, um, she still had that crack addiction. And oftentimes, she would lock them in closets and leave to, you know, go on these drug sprees or whatever. She wouldn't come back for days. And then uh, other times when she didn't lock them in a closet, she would just leave them unsupervised. And um, she would take the welfare money, you know, like a lot of the benefits that they received, and she would use that to get her drugs. Um, so, yeah, that would happen. And while that was happening, you know, Terrell Peterson and his siblings, you know, they would go to the neighbor's house and be like, do you have any food? You know, our mother's not really here. And, you know, the neighbors would be like, what is going on? And, you know, once they found out that this was like, you know, a normal occurrence, they were calling the police. And they were reporting, you know, what she was doing to children's services. It took a while before they had gotten a response. And, um, it did take a while before eventually she was taken, um, she had her kids taken out of her custody. But before that, you know, if she didn't lock them in a closet, she, if she didn't just leave them unsupervised, she would actually take them to Farina's house and they would stay with their grandmother. So Terrell was actually interacting with Farina before he would eventually um, be within her custody. So, you know, the mother lost custody because, you know, eventually Children's Services came and said, you know what, this ain't it. So him and his siblings, they go with Farina. Um, Farina it was supposed to be their grandmother, and then she had a daughter, Terry Lynn, who was supposed to be an aunt. I'm assuming um, things at first were normal until, from what I've read, until um, Farina and Terry Lynn started to suspect that Terrell Peterson was not their actual blood relative. Um, Farina began to suspect that Terrell Peterson wasn't actually her grandson, um, not through blood. I think it was, um, you know, the articles, they vary, and how, and they don't really go into too much detail on how they really found this out. Some say, you know, she found out through her brother or, you know, she, uh, yeah, th that's what I've heard, and there may be other things. That was when Terry Lynn and Farina, you know, they sat together. They were like, you know, we have this kid, and he might not even be related to us. 
Mm-hmm. And then from then, that's where I draw the inference that the treatment started to get different. Um, Terrell Peterson was tied up. He was beat whenever he was bad. And, you know, when they say he was bad, I don't think he was really bad. He was doing typical stuff that five-year-olds do. Like, you know, um, at that age, it's a struggle to, um, you know, get the whole bathroom thing right. So sometimes he would pee on himself, which is what a lot of kids do at that age. So, you know, he would get beat for stuff like that. And they didn't really explain some of the other things he was beat for. Um, So, yeah, that would happen. And so he was constantly tied up. He slept on, like, a cot. So he didn't even have, like, an actual bed. He slept on a cot in the hallway of their house. Mm. And when he was tied up, I believe they used pantyhose, and they tied him up to a banister. So I believe his hands were, like, tied like this to the banister with pantyhose on, if I'm correct. Um, And, you know, he wasn't really fed that much. And if he was fed, it was um, through the instructions that Farina written, if I'm correct, I believe it's he gets grits for breakfast, he gets oatmeal for lunch, and then he gets grits for dinner. Um, But he didn't actually, like, he wasn't given, like, a spoon or a bowl to actually eat himself. I think they had, like, a bowl of, like, grits or whatever, and they had, like, a big spoon, and they would feed him. So he couldn't even eat himself. He would have to open his mouth, put the stuff in, take it out. Hmm. Yeah, so it, yeah, that's just, it's really cringeworthy. Um, so, you know, that was going on, and I'm not sure if I could get the order right, but I remember, um, you know, that when he was fed, it seems to me that that was not a normal occurrence. It was very rare. Um, it was said that the reason why she decided grits and oatmeal was because, you know, she wanted to feed him to where, you know, like he would survive, basically do the bare minimum. But she didn't want him to have any body fat, if that makes any sense. It's horrible, but if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, so he was not fed on a normal day, day-to-day day basis. Hence, um, when he would be a head start or when he would go to school, um, he would be digging in a trash can because he was hungry. And one of the teachers, you know, she was like, why are you digging in a trash can? And he was like, well, you know, I, I haven't really eaten, and I'm hungry. And so the teacher was a little concerned, and she called the grandmother, and she said, hey, uh, you know, Pharrell Peterson, he's digging in a trash here, and he's saying he doesn't really eat. And, you know, the grandmother said, oh, well, you know, don't give him any food, you know, while he's there at school, because if you do, he'll just poop on himself. That's literally what she told the teacher. Okay. Right. I, if somebody said that to me, I'm not sure if I would just take that at face value. That's a little weird. After that, um, that's really all that we heard from the school really doing anything or intervening. I think it was it. Um, so he, he wasn't potty trained. Oh, you tell me at that age he was not potty trained. That's why she said that, you think? Or? I don't know. And the reason why I don't know is because when I was reading the case or the article, it said nothing about him actually doing that. It just said that that was her excuse when she called the teacher. The teacher didn't report any instances of him actually doing that, which I think is interesting. Okay. It was just what the grandmother had said. So it's from what I from the articles that I've been reading, it seems to me that that was just an excuse that she had, and she felt that you know um, that teacher who questioned it, she would be like, okay, he's not potty trained. I'll just leave it there. That's what it's coming across to me as. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, that, as a teacher, I mean, was she not concerned with the fact that he was just digging through a garbage can? And why would he lie about why he was digging in a garbage can at that age? I mean, he's kind of still he's still innocent to me. He's still got a little bit of innocence. And uh, it's like he was very hungry if you're going to go to the extremes of digging in the garbage can. And then I will question the grandmother. Why would she say something like that? It's like, I don't know. It's just like it's like everybody failed him. All the grown ups failed him. That's what it sounds like. The grown people. What you just said was my exact question because that's just odd to me. Um, and I wonder. And someone else, someone else who covered this story, you know, they were giving their opinion. They said something, and I think it may be true. They feel like some details 
or like some things about this case or whatever, like what was in the media, it may not have been a complete story because some of this is just not quite making sense. That right. is one of them. I can't imagine a teacher, you know, you have a Head Start program. There's a five-year-old digging in a trash can. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine, you know, and you call the person who's responsible and that person says, you know, well, you know, he, he's not, you know, he, he poops on himself all the time. Don't give him food. That makes absolutely no sense. Everything that you just said was exactly what I thought. Like, mm -hmm. come on now, you're an adult. What mm -hmm. five-year-old is digging in a trash can for food? That's not normal at all. Mm -mm. You know, typically if a kid, because, you know, kids, they, they have the munchies. Typically they'll be like, you know, if they see another kid, they'll be like, oh, can I have some fruits next to it? Or they'll probably take it and, you, you know, right, right, right. you know, fits, you know, fights are going to start. You know, like, why do you take my food, give it back? That's the normal stuff. Or, you know, like if, you know, if the teacher has candy, because, you know, like when you're in school, like if you have candy and the kids are like, oh, can I have some candy? You're like, yeah, if you be good. You know, that's the normal. But digging in a trash can? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, like the, the grandma didn't say she, she basically said, she didn't say nothing about her not feeding the kid. I mean, she basically didn't say, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, she, yeah. she not denied that she was not feeding her. Yeah, exactly. Say, and that's, him, right? exactly. That was what I, I was like, you know, I don't know who this teacher is, but I'm like, wow, that's just crazy. I'm confused. I'm like, I'm like, hold on. Let me, let me make this sense. This grandmother just told you not to feed him while he's at school because he poops on himself. First off, have you ever seen a kid do that? Clearly you haven't because if you did, you would have called him. You know, you would have called people and be like, hey, you know, your kid is not potty trained. He's about to go to kindergarten. This ain't it. Preschool or kindergarten, you know, this ain't it. You know, y'all need to get it together. But there was no, um, there was nothing that said that anything like that was happening. So it's likely she hasn't even seen him do that. Two, he's digging in a trash can. You just told the grandmother that, you know, you know, your your grandson is digging in a trash can. She didn't even address that. She just straight up said, don't feed him while he's at school because he poops on himself a lot. What does that have anything to do with the fact that he was digging in a trash can looking for food? And that he said yeah. that he hasn't eaten in days. Like you said, the grandmother didn't even say anything about that. Well, and she's not as feeding the, him at home, right? She don't want him to poop at home either then. That's the problem. People poop. You know, they're supposed to poop. After we exactly. Eat stuff like that. Right. Like, I just can't, you know, and for the teacher, you know, I was, and now maybe she, it doesn't, from what I'm reading, I haven't seen to where, like, you know, she reported the incident. That was all that I saw about that teacher. So from what I take it, I think that was the last conversation that they had. And, see, that confuses me because I'm like, you didn't say anything to the, like, did you say anything to the principal? Did you say anything to the administration? You know, I didn't see that in any of the articles. So I'm assuming that that conversation, you know, with the higher-ups did not happen. And I just think that's odd also because it was a Head Start program. If I'm correct, aren't Head, uh, Head Start programs, aren't those typically for, like, low-income kids who can't necessarily afford, um, who can't afford, like, preschool? Or am I, you know, mix, am I mixing I'm the a, programs up? I mean, it means low income. I was a product of a Head Start, so it's been a, it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's but I was a product of a Head Start, and I remember going to Head Start. It was an interesting time. But my thing is this is like it's weird because if I was the teacher, that child would not have went home that night. I would have called the authorities and, you know, we would have did something. Else. It would not have been going back to Grandma's place. The kid would I was have been thinking that. Place that night. But the reason I brought up the Head Start thing, and I was asking if it was typically for, like, low income or, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, low no. income, yeah. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because, you know, if you, if that's the type of kids that you're dealing with, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you have a little bit more awareness? You know what I'm saying? And, like, with you him should. being a foster child, I'm sure, you know, because with foster kids, at least from what I see today, I'm not sure if it was like this in the 1990s, 
typically there's a lot of programs or there's a lot of resources that typically are there for like uh, foster kids to have. And I think, you know, maybe him being a foster kid, that was a part of the reason why he was within the Head Start. I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no way that the school could have known that he was not a foster kid. Well, they know, but they, like, do they care? Like you said, they got all – it's like if a doctor give you medication and then another doctor give you medication, but you're allergic to some, something in the medication the other doctor gives you, but yet they have access to your records. How come they can't use cross-reference make sure you don't get sick? Exactly. So I was just thinking, like, you know, like, okay, so, you know, the kids that you probably are, you know, responsible for, you know, they probably come from homes that, you know, they, they're not really that privileged. So you factor into that, and you have this five-year-old who's digging in a trash can. Like, I'm sorry, but red flag, especially with the fault some of this, like, red flag should have been drawn from that standpoint. And, you know, from what I've read, it didn't seem like she further inquired. And, you know, with what else happened, I don't think she did. And that's just a bit odd to me. That makes absolutely no sense. And you can't really say that race had to do with it because from what I've gathered, this was a African-American community. So that's another thing that I'm like, okay, well, you can't really say that, you know, maybe race, you, you know, maybe you could say, well, maybe, you know, like, a, you know, this was a white school, you know, they don't really care about this. Like, you, you can't even really say that. This was our people. You know, that was a little bit odd. And then. One, so, you know, that happened. And then the next thing that I found was that um, apparently Terrell Peterson, it was during Thanksgiving, he had received, like, a severe beating. It was so bad to the point that, you know, he had to go to the hospital. Um, I can't remember if it was Terry Lynn who had took him to the hospital or if the mother was visiting for Thanksgiving and she found him and took him to the hospital. I think, you know, some of the articles, they may have said different things. But, yeah, he was taken to the hospital, and the doctor was like, oh, he has uh, battered child syndrome. Um, I was like, you know, I was reading, I was like, well, what is that? Looked it up. Basically, this kid is being abused. And, you know, he was like, in my 20 years of practice, this is some of the worst abuse that I've seen ever before. I think he reported it because after that incident had happened, that was when there was a case that was brought to court. Um, Farina, at that time, she was possibly going to be charged with misdemeanors of child neglect or child abuse, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what was happening. Um, so a part of the trial or the court hearing or whatever, Terrell Peterson was required to show up and testify what was happening to him. He didn't show up. He didn't show up because his caseworker did not pick him up and take him there to court so he could testify. So the judge, because Terrell Peterson was not there, she basically uh, dismissed the case and said, well, Terrell Peterson didn't show up. So, mm. you know, she didn't really abuse him, so let, let's just dismiss the case. Um, there couldn't be a another court date to be rearranged because the caseworker, not only did she not pick him up and take him to court for the hearing, but on top of that, she then falsified a report and said that Terrell Peterson was not being abused and that Farina was not responsible for any abuse. Mind you, at that time, if I'm correct, his caseworker was not even making weekly, like she wasn't doing her monthly visits that she was required to. She hadn't been there in a while. So because she put that false report there, the judge went ahead and confirmed what she was about to do and she just dismissed the case. So Terrell Peterson gets back with Farina, and literally, I think they said within a week or three weeks after that happened, Farina is like, um, Terrell, you, you almost had me serving a sentence for this? Like, um, no, I'm going to teach you a lesson. So she made him stand on a heat grate or a heat grifter, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. and she had to have made him stand on that for a while. Because, you know, the next day when he went to school, he could barely walk. And, you know, the teacher was like, what? She was like, what is wrong with you? Like, you're not walking normal. He didn't say anything at that time. And I'm not, I think it was the same teacher. I'm not sure. But, you know, um, he didn't say anything to her. He just, he just stood there. And she was like, well, let me take his shoe off. She took his shoe off. The bottom of his foot was burned off. I think he was suffering from, like, 
I think it was third degree burns. Let me see. I think it was like third degree burns. It was so bad. But the burnings on the bottom of his feet was so bad. He had to go to the hospital. They had to take skin from his hip and place it at the bottom of his feet. And um, I think, so I was watching another podcast that was talking about this, and they were saying, you know, um, how was he able to get this surgery without, you know, any red flags being raised? You know, none of the doctors were like, um, why is this flag real? Why are his feet burned off or whatever? But apparently, um, Farina, I guess she had told the doctor, she was like, you know, Terrell, he was standing on a heat grifter, um, and he ended up getting burned. And she said, I was trying to self-treat them myself, but it ended up getting worse and it got affected. That's why he has to go get this surgery. I think that's what she told the medical people. So I have three thoughts on that. One, even with the excuse that she gave, that was complete bull crap. Um, later, you know, you know, the final case, you know, this was after he passed away. I think it was a doctor from Morehouse or whatever. They said even if, you know, if you went by what he had said, um, there is no way a five-year-old would stand on something as hot as that until his feet burned off. Any five-year-old, the, the half a second a toe even lands on that, he would have jumped off, hmm. period. And then the second thought is, you know, most people, you know, if you're around younger kids and stuff like that, you know, you hear a kid scream, you're like, you know, you cringe a bit. You're like, what, what's the problem? Can you imagine, like, he had to have been standing there for a while, and she literally, like, Farina and, you know, Terry Lynn and the living boyfriend was there, they literally watched him suffer. What type of person could even do that right. for as long as they did? A five-year-old. And, I mean, you saw the kid. It's, a, it's an adorable little boy. Like, I just, you, she really, because he, obviously he was in so much pain, you know. He had to have been. I'm, he was screaming, crying. Probably scared not to do what she said because, you know, well, what would happen? You know, what would Farina do to me if I didn't do what she told me to do? But, like, he had to have been standing there for a while. And, like, she literally watched him go through all of that. And that's just a little hard for me to comprehend. I don't understand that. I don't understand how you could do that to a five-year-old that young to watch them screaming in pain. That just goes to show you, you know, not knowing the psychology of these people, but that just goes to show you the type of people that Farina and Terry Lynn were. It's disturbing. So, you know, that happened. Um, you know, after he was at the hospital and stuff, he came back. And, you know, one day, um, well, this is what Terry Lynn said. He just randomly dropped to the ground, and she screamed, and she took him to the hospital. And, you know, he was there for about 30 minutes, and then he ended up passing away. What actually happened, the coroner said what, what actually happened was he uh, had a blunt force to the head. That was the core cause of why he was taken out, but with all the abuse that he had underwent, Mm -hmm. You know, to get, to have a really, really harsh impact to the head, and then on top of everything that he was going through, that is what caused his death. So the, you know, the hit to the head is what triggered it, but with, you know, all the symptoms, you know, all those scars and all the aching, all the pain, and, you know, only being 29 pounds, you know, because wow. you're starving, that's what, you know, lessens his, lessen his chances of, of survival after he was hit in the head. And then that was when, you know, because they were examining the body, and they said you couldn't place two fingers on his body without running into some type of scar. And, you know, a lot of those scars, you know, they were purple and different colors indicating they'd been there for a while. And they were all over his, you know, his legs. His, they said his head, torso, and extremities, which is basically his entire body. Um, some articles said that, you know, there were bite marks on him. Um, others 
said that there were um there were like scars on the corners of his mouth or like scars on his mouth, which indicated that he was force fed. Um, which later was to found out he he was, you know, when he was um when he was fed food, oftentimes he was force fed and sometimes um Miss Farina or Miss uh, Terry Lynn would make him dig in a toilet and eat waste from the toilet. Wow. Yeah. Was he, and was he sexually abused as well? Or they talk about they didn't it? say. Uh, no, I don't think so. How they treat him. It's very sadistic how he was treated. Yeah, and it. Yeah, he was forced to eat um, waste repeatedly, so it, it didn't just happen. Um, they also said, you know, with the type of scarring, they identified with what he was hit with, um, extension cords, dog collars, Shoes, belts. Belts is typically what people use for whoopings. Um, but, you know, the, the extension cords in a dog collar, you know, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was just a glimpse of some of the torturous things that he had went through. And, you know, eventually, you, you know, he had gotten hit in the head and, with all that he went through, he was taken out. So, you know, um, when the police went into the house to investigate, they immediately identified the pantyhose that he was tied with. They said that there was DNA on it. So what DNA would it, like, so would that have been blood? Like, what do you think that that would have been? Probably blood they said or, was, or hair or whatever. I mean, you know, what they already get samples from. I mean, I guess oh. That. Okay, yeah. So they like when they went into the house, they immediately found the pantyhose. You know, they found the dot, all of that stuff. Um, so they so could yeah. have prevented that. Like, if the authorities just did the right thing, if they just did the right thing early, this could have been prevented. Yeah, and the sad thing was, was you know, um, when Terry Lynn and you know Farina, you know, they was in court. It was just a hot mess because then Terry Lynn. She was talking about, um, you know, well, at first, originally, um, if I'm correct, I think she was tried separately. Um, There's a lot of different articles, and they say conflicting things, so it is a bit confusing. But when she was testifying, she literally tried to blame her 11-year-old niece. Like, she tried to say that, you know, like, oh, I I, I could not have put hands on Terrell. You know, I'm too heavy-handed. It was my niece who did it. And I just, when I read that, I was like, are you serious right now? Like, you literally just tried to blame a child for torturing and murdering a five-year-old to death? By the way, I didn't mention his siblings. They were living there at the time. Tasha, I think she was 11 at the time that he died. She was there. Tommy was six. So Tommy was a little bit older than him. Um, they were living there at the time of his entire abuse and, you know, until his death. Um, reportedly, they were not abused themselves. But sometimes, you know what a lot of child abusers do. They typically have, like, one child participate in beating him, you know, that's or beating him, you know, that type of stuff. So that did go on. Um, but, yeah, when he, you know, when uh, Farina and Terry Lynn were being tried for his death, um, Tommy and Tasha were not present at the you know, hearing. I think they were just too traumatized. That's what I was reading in a the case. They were too traumatized to even be there. Um, yeah, and eventually they were sent to other families. Yeah, so that is what happened. And, you know, you they were both sentenced to life in prison. There was a live-in boyfriend. It was Terry Lynn. Mm-hmm. But um, it says that he was indicted, which I guess means, you know, he was up for those charges, but they don't really say what happened to him. He's not listed. I know I'm reading the at the mouth. It says uh, on Wikipedia, Farina Peterson received a life sentence for Terrell's murder. In December 2002, Terry Lynn Peterson, the victim's aunt, was found guilty of his murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, Ralph Mitchell, the official who engaged in a cover-up of the case and wrote the phony press release Retired with a state pension. Which is crazy. Catherine E. Uh, Maliki, 
who dismissed charges against Farina Peterson because Terrell was not a, was not brought to court. This well, still yep. a municipal court judge in Atlanta. So yeah, that was Terrell what I was Barnes, saying. The governor at the time who signed the Terrell Peterson Act ran for Georgia governor again in 2010, but lost. But you know the lawyer, you know, you talk about uh, lawyer Don Keenan who sued yeah. the state of Georgia on Terrell's behalf. Yeah, what he was saying like, thank God he was dead. I think anybody who would have known or understood what this little guy was going through would rejoice in his death. That's something. Wow. Yeah. So I wanted to comment on that. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, mm-hmm. I understand what the lawyer said 100%. I actually disagree with that, though. Um, I see where he's coming from. Like, you know, oh, my gosh, the hell that he went through. But I guess I, you know, part of me wishes that he could have, survived and, you know, I mean, had gotten the therapy and stuff like that, but had been placed with a family who actually loved him. I guess I'm just a little sad at the fact that, you know, his five years on this earth were literal hell, and that's all that he knew. I just wish that he could have been given a second chance, you know, to be placed with a family that loved him, and, you know, he could grow up and have a thriving life. There are horrible things on this planet, but there are also wonderful things that he never got to experience. So that's just my perspective. Yeah. What do you think? I, I mean, the pa- people, grown people felt him. I mean, he was an innocent kid. He didn't, you know, they put him in a, in a position to not live. He would have been 28 years young this year. He would have been, been a young man. With a, you know, no telling what he could have done if he got the right type of love and nurture and care. But you see this happening time and time again because even when you read him, he said he was, more, he was one of more than 800 children who died between 1995 and 1998 after their cases were brought to the attention of the Georgia Department of Human Services. So they failed 800 kids in that period. And God knows how many more since that time. Uh, but I hate I to, yeah, go ahead. yeah, and I hate to say this, but, you, and you know, I think both of those kids were probably African-American. And it's interesting because during that time, if I'm correct, there was a murder. Um, it was on national news. There was a, these murders of, like, these young black boys. Um, there was, like, a serial killer. He was on a little... Oh, that's the child murder. They happened in the early... It was, they happened in yes. the early 80s. But they caught a guy named Wayne Williams, but I think the case was reopened because people don't think he was the actual killer. Right. The yeah. And the thing was, is I was watching a documentary on that, and, you know, it was interesting because there was a quote that was made, and they said, you know, at, in the 80s, like, the early, the late 70s, 80s, 90s, Atlanta, like the politicians, they were trying to make Atlanta into a really, really great city. Yeah. And that was what their focus was. And unfortunately, when it, they left a lot of people behind. A lot of lower class African Americans were left behind. And so when cases like this occurred, unfortunately, you know, the politicians didn't have the perspective of, you know, well, you know, as an African-American, you know, within our community, we need to protect our kids. No, their perspective was this is absolutely a disaster for the image that we're trying to make of Atlanta. This is not what we want to be known for. So let's try to make this go away. So that was said in that documentary um, when it was talking about, you know, those murders that you, you know, just mentioned that were happening in the 80s. And I wonder if that attitude it was even extended to the 90s as well. And I wonder, is that a part of why children's services, by the way, most of these people who were working under it and had positions were African American. So I wonder if that was a part of why a lot of these cases were severely, severely mishandled. It was because, you know, a lot of people, they didn't want people to find out about this. They wanted it to go away. So that's great, my thought. Yeah. No, you make yeah. point, you got to think about it. They brought the uh, Olympics to Atlanta back in '96. You had like Maynard Jackson and Andrew Young. These are the first black mayors of Atlanta, so they had a lot of money involved. They try to make Atlanta the black mecca, black Hollywood now yeah. is the black mecca. It's a shining star, whatever. But yeah, that is possible. I, I definitely agree it was a cover up because they still would find kids missing and killed after they arrested Wayne Williams. And I knew a, a woman who mom dated Wayne Williams. He was weird. Right. But just because you're weird or eccentric don't make you a serial killer. A lot of times a serial killer are, are so-called normal-looking people. 
So you can I say something it. about that? Like that okay, case? Um, and then we'll go back to Terrell. Or maybe a low-key is – well, no, we'll go back to Terrell after this. Uh-huh. So there is a thought, and I just say it is a thought, it is a theory, it is a guess, I'm not saying it's a fact, um, that actually – the Ku Klux Klan and a lot of white supremacists were involved in those killings. Yeah. And mm. so what was happening was they were hella pressed at the fact that Atlanta, a black city, was becoming extremely successful. So they were trying to do things to undermine it. And they were mm. purposefully targeting a lot of black kids and doing a lot of horrible stuff to them because, one, they were trying to take the image. Two, it was conquer and divide. They were trying to cause division within the community, just trying to cause chaos. Um, yeah. The bombing of that daycare that had a lot of African-American children within it. I do believe that that was a direct um, assault from the Ku Klux Klan. They were mm. trying to figure out a way to stop what was happening to Atlanta. And I think that was kind of what explained a lot of those deaths that remain unsolved. Yeah. I so think back to, to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Klan was resurrected in Stone Mount, at Stone Mountain, Georgia, back in 1915. Mm-hmm. So the second version of the Klan came out of Stone Mountain, Georgia, where that group marched on 4th of July, in fact, yeah. level. But yeah, you made some yeah. great points there. I mean, Unfortunately, um, the Klan or any other white supremacist terrorist group or whatever you want to call it, they're kind of our terrorists. Anytime, because, you know, African-Americans, we are kind of at the bottom politically, socially, economically of society. Anytime we try to get out of that, there's always going to be resistance. Hence, you know, the Black Wall Street, you know, and how that was completely destructed by, you know, fabrications and lies. So anytime African-Americans are gaining social, economic, political mobility and improving their position in society, you are going to see white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan always trying to demise and corrupt that. And I think that that is what happened with that. Um, so back to the Terrell Peterson, what else do you think, in those other 800 kids, what else do you think could have factored into that? I mean, the system just ain't, I just, I, I could, I, my uncle, I had an uncle, he passed away about 17 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he was younger, he was being sexually molested by a neighborhood pedophile. It was two pedophiles in the neighborhood back in the day. One was a guy whose sister would, would lure young black boys to their home to be molested. And there was another guy who was a prominent college professor and a board member of a, of a prominent church in the, in the area. He was a, a well-known college professor. He had two black sex predators preying on black boys in the community. And people, everybody in the community knew about it. But what happened was my uncle was doing real well in school, and then all of a sudden he started being disruptive in class. Mm-hmm. His grades dropped. And uh, so the teacher found out what was going on with him. So they had a, a, a you know, teacher-parent and a principal conference with my grandma, and they told her what was happening with him, that he was being molested by a community predator. And... um my grandma wanted to tell the authorities about it. They said, no, no, don't tell the authorities. Just keep them away from the guy. But the thing about it is this guy had access to a lot of neighborhood kids. Like, nobody, you know, everybody knew what was going on. It was weird to me. Like, the grown-ups in the community knew what was happening with their children, but nobody tried to stop this dude or do something to him. And then the same thing with the college professor, what he would do, he would try to lure young boys to cut his grass, whatever, and give them candy and money. Then he'll get them in his home to take advantage of them. So I heard stories of people that got away from this guy. Now, how can these people be allowed to operate like that? I mean, one was very prominent. One was well-known as well. His sister was – because, I, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't understand why my, my parents, my, my mom and my, you know, grandparents and people didn't want me to stay overnight over people's homes. I said, they friends of the family. We don't want you to stay overnight. Just come home. We can't let you stay overnight. I found out later what happened to my uncle – he never got therapy for that, and it, it just traumatized him for the rest of his life. He was a good guy, but because of that experience and not getting therapy, yeah. he chose that he was, I, I think he was conflicted. He was conflicted sexually as far as his identity. So I yeah. think he wanted to be with women and have a family, but because of what happened to him when he was young, it's kind of like it's sad. So he died of uh, AIDS and HIV complications when he was just 40 years old uh, back in oh. 2003. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So we've been going right. down for long. But this comes from slavery, too. You got to think about what happened to us in slavery. 
you know, with the child abuse and even the sexual abuse among both men and women and children. Are we not just selling us into slavery for picking cotton, but to also be sexual slaves? Yes. I, okay, so I don't like, um, I'm not a particular fan of Miss Candace Owens, but there is a quote that she has, and, you know, it's called Get Off the Plantation. And, you know, it is my personal opinion. You know, I haven't done research to confirm this or anything, but I think that, unfortunately, some black Americans, um, particularly in the older generation, they still Mm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. It's like they still have the mindset that they are on. Uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this. Go ahead say it. Go ahead it's like it. they are it. still yeah. operating under the mindset that, like, they are a slave, if that makes any sense. No, so, no. oh, no, that they're powerless, that nothing yeah. can be done. That's what I'm trying to say. Because, you know, back then when stuff was like what you just mentioned, if the slaves had to try to do something, it was a likely chance, you know, something, there was going to be a serious repercussion. They were, they had a lot to be afraid of. And I feel like even after slavery ended, even, you know, as times progressed, you know, with the Jim Crow, for example, the interview that you did uh, with the person whose father had a direct relation to the Emmett Till murder, you know, mm-hmm. look at what happened. What would have happened if he had not a comply? They killed them. And unfortunately, I think because of that, um, a lot of us have this mindset of when things are happening that are bad, there's nothing that can be done. Because if we try to do something, you know, something is going to happen to us. And I feel like when it comes to situations like you described or like, you know, situations like, well, I don't know about Terrell Peterson because maybe that was on some other stuff. But, you know, situations in general, um, I think that kind of, you know, a lot of us, we still kind of have this idea that, like, we're powerless and there's nothing that we can do. And I think it sometimes manifests into the situations that we're faced with. I don't know. What do you think? I, I agree with you. But they're killing you anyway. I mean, a lot of us are already dead. Like, Dr. King, they'll come. Dr. King said, you're going to get us killed. I said, Dr. King said, if a man ain't willing to die for anything, you ain't fit to live anyway. You already dead. You don't even know yeah. you're spiritually dead. Yeah. You walk around like zombies, mindless. I know you have free yeah. will or a chance to do what you want to do. But if you're not willing to put your life on the line for what you want, you're not alive anyway. So a lot of us just dead anyway. And I think that kind of plays a role into why we don't react in the ways that we should be when we have these situations, you yeah. know. So I had a, another question. Um, Okay, so with the Farina, have you, because the thing that's a little confusing to me with her Mm -hmm. is, you know, this was an older woman, okay, an older Mm -hmm. black Southern woman. What I'm trying to figure out is how can a woman who, you know, she she lived through the Jim Crow, you know, she's seen Mm -hmm. a hand in that. She's seen the direct oppression of, like, black Americans in a way that somebody of my generation could have never seen. I'm Mm -hmm. trying to grasp how someone could see this stuff on a day-to-day basis, you know, um, and inflict such horrific harm on a young black man. You just came out of Jim Crow South. It's generational trauma that's been passed on, you know. Think about the lynchings and all this stuff that people in the gym. I mean, the rape. I mean, you think about, you know, just think about protect black women, right? You know, you think about yeah. You know, this year will mark like the... Uh, 65th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott. Well, people don't really talk about that much, but before the Montgomery bus boycott happened, you had black women being raped by police officers and bus drivers down in Montgomery. And it was the case of uh, Reese Taylor, this black woman coming home from church, young black woman married and stuff with a young child at home, was gang raped by six to seven white men coming home from church back in September of 1944 in Alabama. She just passed away maybe a couple of years ago. She was almost 100 years old. But imagine living with that for decades, right? You know, uh, living with that shame. They, then they try to say she was a prostitute, but this woman's coming home from church. With right. Her friend, her best friend's son, and gang raped by white men who basically admitted that they did it, but were never convicted. Never, uh, the grand jury did not indict them. 
And yeah. they basically admitted to doing this to this woman. And then, like, the, but the thing about it is Rosa Parks was called, Rosa Parks was called to investigate Dr. Reese Taylor. She was part of NACP back then, as she was when she refused to remove herself from that bus seat. So she wasn't just a reactionary. She was actually a revolutionary and activist. She was doing right. this for a long time. So she investigated what happened to Reese Taylor. And, um, yeah, it's like, it, you know, you think about this has been happening. Black people have not always been allowed to be in control of our black bodies in this country. We're not allowed, whether it be Terrell Peterson or Reese Taylor or whoever, they won't allow us to help control of our bodies. Even as we do this on Sunday, you know, $40 million slaves on NFL, you know, you're going to play. We don't care if you get COVID and all this stuff. Or basketball, you know what I'm saying? Let's shut up and dribble. We don't. We don't have sovereignty over who we over who we are as a people in this country, and that's the problem. And then we don't have understanding who our, our our real identity is either. We're not rooted in who we right. really are as a people. So you right. see that type of confusion and self hate that uh, that the grandma had, you know, for her grandson and for herself. So yeah, she and was a victim as a uh, real. Right, and it's also like because you know the uh, the daughter Terry Lynn, you know, when she was, you know, they were questioning her. You know, they said, like, how could you, I think the question was, like, how could you, like, you saw your nephew slowly dying before your eyes? And she said something to the likes of, well, you know, Farina abused me when I was younger. You think I have any morals? Right. And I'm just like, the thing that's interesting to me is, you know, Farina, in all the articles that I've read, they didn't explain her line of profession. But I know that Terry Lynn, she was working. But she had a living boyfriend who was just living there. So the thing with Terry Lynn that's really interesting is, you know, you have this grandmother who, you know, going off of what she said, had abused you. And from what I'm guessing, she ain't really working. Um, Outside of the fostering, is she really bringing you any money in? And she was also sickly. And then you have a living boyfriend. And it's you like know, are they worried in welfare section eight type of reality, you thinking? Huh? Well yeah, like a welfare section eight reality. Like Um, from what I look at this apartment, mm-hmm. it looked like section they was in southwest Atlanta apartments. They didn't name the apartment well. I I don't think they would do that. That would be so right. cool for the landlord. I feel bad for that landlord. Imagine what that did for them, Jesus. Mm. But from what I'm looking, it looked like it, it was probably a welfare of Section 8 type house, just from my personal experience. Yeah, you it think, wasn't the- Yeah, well, I want to ask you this. Cause I think I could see a documentary. I could see you doing a documentary about this, a feature length documentary about this. You're very passionate. Yeah. Do you think um, you talk on record? You think that uh, Terrell Peterson, Mom, what happened to her? That's a question that I have. Because after they was describing her crack addictions, that was practically the last time that we heard about her from what I was reading in the article. That's another question I have. Um, but back to the question I was going to ask is, Terry Lynn, this woman abused you? And, I mean, that's what she said. And I'm just questioning, like, you would really let somebody like that live, live with you? Like, and then to turn around and participate in abusing your nephew when you supposedly went through the same thing. And then on top of that, you have a living boyfriend. So you have a man who's living off of you and not doing anything. He was 22 at the time, and I think she was 28. Okay. So it's like, you got, sis, you got a lot of issues. That ain't my sister, but you get what I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a lot going on there, you know. And somebody, because I was talking to somebody, and they were like, well, you know, Angela, maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome. And, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was like, oh, yeah, it, it probably is Stockholm Syndrome, you know. But, yeah, I, I just... So we all got Stockholm Syndrome. We still want to be around people that, that that abuse us and don't respect us. So we all dealing with different... It's a spectrum of Stockholm right. Syndrome that we all dealing with. So on the right. And, you know, it's that she was 28 at the time. And so I'm she's just 50 like... now, I guess, in her 50s. Right. I'm like, to have done such a heinous thing at that age, like, it's just, what in the world? And then another thing that I'm wondering is the siblings. Mm-hmm. What was it like for them to see that on a day-to-day basis? Because, yeah, you know, they... It would be disturbing. Like, like, they, they were not abused. In abuse. They could have participated in abuse until real, allegedly. It's possible. Yes. Yeah, that's... 
they're forced to. I was thinking at myself. I was like, I don't. Well, Tommy, because they were saying Tommy in particular was really, really, really traumatized. So I take it he was in severe tears. You know what I'm saying? Like he was just. From what they were saying, he it sounded like, you know, it, it really broke him down, the fact that his brother died. So I'm wondering, you know, Tasha was 11. So I'm wondering if maybe she may have, you know, participated in the beatings. I'm not entirely sure. But I wonder, like, from their perspective, like, I don't know how, I don't know how I could be in a house like that. Because Tasha, she was 11. You know, she's about to enter her teenage years. Mm-hmm. Did she not say anything about it to when she was in school? Did she not talk to a cat? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, now she, Tommy, yeah. yeah. Now Tommy, he was you, you know he was he was around Terrell's age. I understand that, but I guess Tasha, I'm a little like, hmm. She didn't really say anything. You know, she was was she just appearing as if she was a normal kid? Like, like if I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. That was just odd to me. Well, you know, we got a lot of trauma in our community, a lot of taboo. You know, we don't talk about incest, rape, and all this other stuff we've been going through as a people for generations. Uh, mental health is very important right now, especially in a time like this. We all need some therapy and some healing some type of way. But, uh, I mean, now she would be of age, she probably has kids of her own. And hopefully she's not doing the things that she learned or saw at home to her kids, you know, or children. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I tried to, like, look up the name or whatever. Couldn't really find her. And someone said, well, you know, it's highly likely that when Tommy and uh, Tasha, when they got sent to do families, the parents probably completely changed their names yeah, because yeah. they didn't want them to be associated with that. And, you know, I thought that was really interesting. Um, but, yeah. So now with Farina, I think she was – let me read this article. She was – to I think she was 48. Let's see. No, she was 48 when the Child Welfare Agency pressured the mother to sign up guardianship to Farina. So she was 48. Okay, so Terrell Peterson died when he was five. So she may have been in her, she was just entering her 50s mm-hmm. when she went into prison. and So she's probably in her 70s now. 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. That also tells me that she must have had Terry Lynn at a young age, and she also was not married, because it doesn't sound as if the grandfather, there was no grandfather there. No, it was like a lot of, a lot of women, along with a, a beta male, like the live-in boyfriend. I hate uh, to I'm not trying to be the live-in boyfriend. Yeah. Because I, I was sitting there that's, thinking, that's I was toy, like. Big toy, whatever he was, so. Oh, oh! So, what made you think of that? I didn't think because you know you're a man. He's young. He ain't doing no work. He got a lot of energy. So, hey. Oh, see, you're a man, so you you know you think from a male perspective. That's not something I would have thought of. I mean, but he's really good for. I guess besides taking out the garbage and doing that and laying pipe, laying pipe and taking out the garbage. (laughs) He had no job. No. I don't know. I'll be like, and you know the articles, they shaded him. You know he ain't had no, because they said the live-in boyfriend. Right. The live-in. Yeah. So you're just a, 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 some type of appliance for her, like, a, you know, he's a, he's a human vibrator, I would say, allegedly. Speculate. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because I think they said he was 22, so, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Terry Lynn. Baby boy, like, baby boy. You ever seen the movie Baby Boy? Oh, years ago. Yeah, I don't even remember. Yeah. Come on, I, years ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, this arrested development among black people, in particular black males, we're not allowed to be men. There's a difference between a black male and being a black man. Mm. Black man got, you know, accountability, tries to provide, sets a great example, do what he can, you know, just whatever. He just be a man, man up. A lot of dudes are males. They don't want to be men. Not necessarily gay, but they don't want the responsibility of being a man. I see what you're saying because I'm thinking, yeah. I'm like, because I was talking to some of my male friends, and they said, let me tell you something. Let, let some woman do that to me. And they said, no offense, Angelique, Miss Farina would have been dead. Right. She right. would have been you know? dead. Yeah. And they said, let me find out 
that my grandma, you, they want to talk about their grandmother specifically, you know, the hypothetical. Let me find out that my grandmother is doing that to my younger brother. She would have been dead. No, they didn't say call. No, they're going to call the police. No, they said she would have been dead. Themselves. It's free justice, yeah. And that just struck me. I was like, oh, like, you know, I got like a, that was a strong reaction from like the guys I was talking to. So that's why I was thinking with the living boyfriend, the living boyfriend, what were you doing? Or were you participating? Or were you just sitting there? Was he sexually abused by, I mean, they were doing it, cigarette burns. It's like some S&M stuff going on. I mean, some sick sex stuff going on with that. Oh, I didn't even. Wow. See, you've I been mean, here a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot longer than I have. So you know, I didn't even think about that. Well, you that's good. You don't think like that. <laughs> it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, freaky and dark stuff that people do. It's some good. Everybody has their dark side. You know, everybody got a dark side. Everybody got their own fetishes and stuff like that. Uh, but that what makes us all human. But at the same time, to act out on certain things makes you a monster. You know, like, you know, like, man, like, you have no humanity, man. Like, you, you abuse a kid like that when he weighs just 29 pounds. He's five years old. He ain't like he's living in a third world country, allegedly. He's supposed to be a third world country, but why is he in that treatment or in that state of being? he got grown people with authority and, and responsibility. They killed them. The system killed Terrell Peterson. Right. I'm trying to read. Let me see. Let me see. Because there's a particular... Let me see. Most of his injuries were, uh, yeah, they said marks, scars, lacerations, ear badly scarred, ear badly scarred, mark pattern. What's a mark pattern? That just means marks in a pattern. Yeah, yeah, scars, yeah. So, like a belt, I'm guessing? Belt, uh, extension cord, switch, I don't know I mean. Got it, that makes sense. Yeah, buttock swollen. And tender reddish, oh yeah, because of that belt. Yeah, that makes lower lower back marks and left forearm. Yeah, he, he didn't have a chance, man. That man never had a chance. It's sad. I just feel like whew, when I let me tell you when I first read about it, I didn't sleep that night because I was just like it was a lot to take in. Mm-hmm. And you know. So I guess what questions, like, do you wonder, like, from hearing this, you know, like, about the case or about Terrell or about anyone involved in that? I mean, my thing is, why did people get rewarded for, for bad behavior? I ain't talking about, no, like, the, the aunt and the grandma was punished, but the people that are supposed to have been provided checks and balances to serve and serve and protect, they got rewarded with pensions and still have jobs. I personally, this is my personal opinion, I don't really have a good perception of caseworkers in general because most people that I know who've been in a foster care, you know, it, it's just it's very stereotypical stuff. I hate to say it. So I already don't have a good image of them in a, to begin with. My personal opinion, if there's a caseworker and they falsify reports saying that there was no abuse and there was, I think not only should they be banned from that field, not only that, but they should also serve sentences for that. Because low key, in my opinion, that's an accessory to murder. That's yeah. just my personal opinion. That, and that's, Especially within his yeah. case, that woman, she should have been sent to prison. Uh, you know, she should have got that twenty five to life. Isn't that typically what they, depending on what it was, uh, well, for accessory know, to murder? Let's, let's look at like this way. This is how crazy the system is. Like with their rapidatory lanes is facing twenty two years in prison for shooting Meg the Stag in the foot allegedly. And the cops that shot Breonna Taylor, they ain't going to jail, they not going to court. I mean the walls had more. You like, never know, I guess. Yeah, but I mean yeah. You know, my thing is this, like I was in, with black people I know we don't believe in mob justice and lynch law like they do. You know, that like they don't wait for no grand jury decision or indecision and say, you know what, we feel like this dude did what he did, we're going to kill him. We're going to lynch him, we're going to hang him. A lot of people, we got this faith in the system that don't even respect us as human beings. Like, you know, how can you beg the devil for mercy when the devil ain't qualified to give you mercy, only more hell? So I think it's weird that black folks keep on thinking that, oh, man, I'm so disappointed that so-and-so didn't get, you know, indicted. You know, it's not your system. It's not made for your benefit or for your protection. 
So when we look at the Terrell Peacing case, the system failed this man. He wasn't worth nothing to the system. Yeah, or it's to just, his folks, you know. Yeah, it. The thing that really pissed me off, I was already pissed off, but this tipped me over the edge. Mm-hmm. Well, his lawyers, I think, the good thing is they, I think they actually raised money to like uh, for his grave and stuff like that, but the thing that pissed me off, nobody showed up to his funeral. Mind you, I think Farina went to church, you know, she went to a Baptist, you know, she went to a black church. Um, no, none of them. Nobody, no one from the family, none of them showed up to a funeral. And now somebody had told me, they said, well, you know, Angelique, it probably could be, not that they didn't care, but that it was a, too much for them to take in at the moment. And that was just an intense moment. But you know what? I don't even understand. You know, they were saying, you know, maybe it was just a little too intense for a family to decipher. Or maybe it was, you know, a mixture of shame, you know, or, you know, like, oh, my God, this is a horrible kid. Let's just go away. I don't want my face attached to this. You know, they were saying, you know, maybe those were the reasons. But even there, I was like, I don't understand that. You didn't even have the decency to give him a decent, you know, grave. You didn't even have the decency to, you know, make sure that he's resting in peace. That did not sit right with me. And, you know, they failed him in life. They should be ashamed. Yeah. They're just as guilty as the folks that killed him. Right. And now uh, I wonder, so I, I wonder this, and you might want to edit this part out of, you know. No, no, you, know, you speak your mind. You speak your mind. But, well, no, I wonder, so, like, you know how you were talking about, like, possibly interviewing, like, Farina or Terry, Terry Lynn or whatever? Right. I was wondering, like, do you think that they would agree to it or, like. What well, they got to lose? They didn't, they ain't never getting out. Or you can make it so, they so sympathetic, they might get parole. I don't know. If they could tell they side the story, because we're not getting the full truth from the letter journal constitution or the mainstream press, we don't even know what's going on. We speculate on a lot of stuff, right? We don't know what really happened and what happened to the people after that, you know. So it would be great if you could get their story from them. But how would you approach it? Yeah, because I do want to contact the lawyer. I was able to uh, connect with him on LinkedIn. So, you know, after this video, then I do want to kind of, you know, explain, you know, what we talked about and see, you know, if we could get his perspective and all of that. I do want, one, I want to figure out the mother. Where's she at? You know what I'm saying? She, that's what I, it would be really good if, like, we could find her, we could see her, the siblings. Somebody said, to be honest, the siblings, that might be a lost cause. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You don't think so? Oh, they were saying it might be. Now, you mm. can still find people. You can, anybody can be found except for Jimmy Hoffa. Anybody can be found. <laughs> mm. But, but uh, no, I think this is a passion project for you. You should make a, a documentary on this and go all yeah. in. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, but it's also like, I'm just wondering, like, how would, I think you should send the message to Farina or Terry Lynn. Um, cause, well, you know, j you know, I'm ghetto. You know, I know what j is. Oh, yeah, well, you know, you're all right. You know, I think you, it should come. I mean, look, I, I would I'm love just, to work on a project with you a long time. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, with you on this thing. Because I think it's very yeah. important to the story out there, and you're so passionate about it. I yeah. You're a social worker yourself, but you're so young. Oh, <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> if I ever became, like, really successful, though, like, let's say I ever got, like, money, I would donate to, like, the idea of halfway homes. So, like, if a kid, like, in, like, especially in, like, at-risk areas for, like, where there's mostly kids of color. Um, so that way, like, if a kid is being abused themselves, they can literally just go there and be like, this is what happened to me. I cannot return home for the night. Or, you know, like, something like that. Yeah, I agree too. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Um Cause to be honest with you, somebody was like, "Oh, you're so passionate. You should be a social." I was like, "Hell no!" Because that's it. Let's just, let's just be. Let's just keep it real. A lot of those people they enter those industries and they ended up becoming dazed and very very frazzled. You know what I'm saying? And I I just don't see myself working with bureaucracy from that standpoint. Um, and I feel like it was just harm you mentally and spiritually and all of that. But yeah, that was one thing that I thought of. Um, you know halfway homes to where, like, kids themselves, you know, putting it out there in, like, you know, black communities or, you know, other communities of color, you know, like, 
if you are a kid that is experiencing this or if you know a kid who is, or I'm not even going to lie to you, if you know that you as a parent, you're not doing this kid right, you really don't like this kid, maybe you should drop the kid off, no questions asked, and we could just go from there. You know, if you're picking up extension, come on now, if you're picking up extension cores trying to hit four- and five-year-olds, you know, maybe if you see a message, you'd be like, you know what? You know, maybe this ain't right. You know, either you could realize, you know, maybe I'm going too far or, you know, maybe you're like, mm, do I really want to get sentenced to life in prison? Nah, maybe this kid needs to go somewhere else. So maybe, you know, the perpetrator can drop the kid off, yada, yada. You know what I'm saying? So that was, that was I... one thing that I was thinking. Um, But, yeah, like, whoo. Jesus. When you, think about, when you say I'm thinking about, you know, the actress, the superstar movie lady, uh, Charlize Theron. What's her name? Charlize or Charlize Theron? Theron. Huh? You know, you know, like the lady, the movie star actress, uh, Charlize Theron. Or Theron. Uh, I'm familiar it's, with her. You, okay, but well, you know she got two black boys she's raising as, as, as girls. Oh yeah, I, I heard it was really controversial. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's disturbing. That's I'll just say it. this: um, I think it would be really good if adoption and like foster fostering was really stressed in the African American community to Black people who had means, you know. And I just think it would be good if, um, you know, it was more of us who, you know, we are a bit privileged, and you know, maybe we could take some of our kids. You know, I think it would be, I just think that that would be good. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And I think if that happens, then, you know, maybe less than desirable situations, you know, wouldn't occur as often. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, was it, what else was I about to say? I also thought of, like, you know, like, would it, I don't know what I would, I don't know, maybe, because you know how to write some letters on JPEG. I don't see myself reaching out to Farina. I don't know. Because I don't know what I would write. Like, how would you approach that? I mean, you honest. I mean, just give it some time. Just be honest. I mean, I just keep on writing until you feel like you got the right, you know, just right drafts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because to be honest, and this is how I personally feel, you know, I may not agree with whatever they, you know, I already don't really think too highly of them. Let's just keep it real. But it's like, I feel like they do need to answer for what they did. We may not like the answer. We may not agree with the answer. But there needs to be some explanation because that's, that's just not okay. And, I yeah, mean, but, yeah, they got charged and stuff. But I feel like nobody really was like, you know, what, 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 was, what was this? Why? Even if, you know, even if they don't, even if they give some bullshit answer, don't tell the truth, that still reveals something about them. You know what I'm saying? I feel like there's not a lot of research or a lot of emphasis on, like, what makes people turn into people who mistreat children, especially in communities with people of color. Yeah. You know, I think that would be um, interesting from that That, standpoint. I think that does need to be examined a bit more because I don't think it is. Um, and also, I think for the job, I think you're the person for the job. <laughs> I know you're the person for the job. <laughs> but but yeah, it's, yeah, it's just interesting. Well, and you, you know, I'll say this. You know, it. I don't mean to sound crass. It could be worse. Because have you heard of Brianna Lopez? It was a little adorable Hispanic baby. They, they took that girl, threw her on the ceiling, and watched her drop to the ground. It was a five-month-year-old. They did that numerous times. Who her did, abuse. Who, who, who did this? Her mom? Oh, this was years ago. Um, it was, so the mother, she knew the abuse was happening and didn't care. And I believe the father and the uncle or something like that. So it was family that was doing this to that poor little baby. She only lived to five months, but they were just doing horrible stuff to her. Tell me why they got their sentencing. Now, it's interesting because, you know, Farina, she got sent. Farina and Terry Lynn, they got sentenced to life. Well, maybe because they're black, but um, the abuser of the Brianna Lopez, I think she's out, if I'm correct. I think they released her on the parole. Let me you see. Know how long ago it was? Brianna, yeah, let me look up the Brianna Lopez. That was just, and the thing that was even upset about that was they put a cage around her grave so people couldn't even put flowers directly on it. 
just uh-huh. evil. Farina did not do that. Farina and Terry Lynn, they did not do that. 2002. 2002, yeah. Horrible. They got the pictures of the baby. Wow. Yeah. Horrible. But yeah, back to like the Terrell Peterson and like the African Americans, and I guess maybe even Latino. You know what? Like within our community, I feel like there needs to be like more research and more awareness as to like you know why is this occurring? You know, what are some preventative measures that we can take? And you know, someone also pointed out. You know, they said people who do stuff like what uh, Farina was doing. They just don't seem to be that very educated. Oh. oh, yeah, I was just saying that people were saying that, you know, the type of stuff that, you know, was happening to uh, with Farino and Terry Lynn, they just didn't strike um, the person I was talking to to be very educated. Probably, you know, it's... Probably, yeah, more than likely not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these were... And someone kind of said a point that was really interesting. You know, a part of Terrell's thing is, you know, they felt like they it's quite possible that they took Terrell because they wanted that foster care check. Because, you know, you get finances, you get, like, some type of funding or whatever when you get a foster kid. So it's quite likely that, you know, maybe for Rena and Terry Lynn, that was a part of the reason why they wanted to keep him because they was getting a check coming in. Like I, I mentioned. Yeah, definitely. Terry Lynn, I mean, she wasn't, you know, she worked some job, but, like, it wasn't noteworthy considering, you know, I'm looking at the apartment complex that they were living at. It looked to be Section 8 type housing. Um, So, you know, they were low income, and and they were not living in an affluent area for, you know, Atlanta. So I do wonder, you know, if, I'm not sure what it's called, but there's this phenomenon I was reading on Reddit, a Redditor explained it, and they said the reason why there is so much, like, rampant abuse, not that all foster parents are like that, but typically foster care attracts people who don't really have a lot of substantial income, a lot of education. They're typically not doing that well in their lives, but they want the money. You know, they want the money. They want the income, so they take in a lot of kids. And that results in a lot of those kids getting abused and mistreated and yada, yada. And they were explaining, like, I forgot what they called it. It's some type of complex. There's a name for this theory. But they were saying that that also contributes to why, like, a, it's, you know, it's not unknown for a lot of foster kids to have experienced some type of abuse. So, you know, that's another component as well because it does strike me. Well, I mean, look at um, Terrell's mother. You know, look at what she was doing. Mm-hmm. So this was probably a low income, probably within a rough area. Yeah. You know, so I think that factors into it as well. So, yeah, um, I don't know. What else comes to your mind about this case that's just. Well, it was, uh, it's like uh, it reminds me, I told you about the Robbie Yummy sex yes. case from Chicago back in the 90s. Uh-huh. I no, I guess it was a slow news week or whatever. They put him on a, yep. a, a big time magazine or life, whatever. Yeah. And it was a tragic story. Like, <clears throat> he was failed yes. by the system, too. And by his family. But the family yes. are victims of the system, too. I mean, yes. we, we as black people, we have been victimized and exploited by this country uh, for things that did not benefit us in the long run. Very true. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we do yeah. have a lot of hurt and pain. So, like, what I said was, you should, you know, I think you would do a great job because you're passionate about this this subject matter about Terrell Peterson. And to reach out to them would be to, like, humanize them to a certain degree. Not saying that they – not to be justify what they did, but, to, hey, you know, they are people, too, that have been abused and neglected and disrespected as well. They may have been abused by family members as well as how they learn how to be cruel towards Terrell. So that's generational curses we're talking about, you know. And that trauma is real. So I think that us just talking about this is very important. So they talk about Black Lives Matter. Well, black pain matters. You know what I'm saying? And we got right. To, you know, and this is what we're doing. Right. I mean, you already have cases like George Steinling. Oh, my goodness. That poor baby. Yeah. He's dead. I'm saying poor baby. He probably would have been my grandfather now. I mean, come on now. Yeah, but, but still, still he's he young. Yeah, you know, the yeah. Emmett Till, you know. Um, 14. 
what is that? Why did his name just slip out of my mind? Um, one of the most mainstream cases, a teen who got shot by the wannabe Mike. police officer, Trayvon <laughs> Martin. Oh, so, yeah, Trayvon Martin got yeah. Right. You know, all of these cases, yeah. like, you, you know, so many young black children, because, you know, there's cases of the women, too, you know, Breonna Taylor. They're getting taken out at the hands of racism. We don't need our community taking out our kids before they have a chance. We yeah. can't have that, too. Mm-hmm. Right, like we, yeah, we need to fix that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, what I, I yeah, got. You on the right side? I think you are, you about solutions and stuff, and about rights and wrongs as much as we can. So I appreciate your efforts and stuff because uh, I think you got an interesting road ahead of you. You're gonna be, you already yeah. a fascinating person. You know, unique. Oh, stuff, so. Thank you. I, but, I, I yeah. look forward to seeing what you got to you know show us. Yeah. So um, I think the next step would be I'm going to try to contact a lawyer because we are connected mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. So I'm going to try that. And then maybe a couple of the teacher. I couldn't find the teacher. Um, okay. I don't know how. I think the true people search, that may be a bit too generic. So I might have to use something else. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Is there like a record or something like that for teachers? I'm trying to figure that out. Hey, well, um, or trying, by the end of you gonna be so like such an expert on this thing. By the end of the day, you gonna help. You gonna write a book about it. You gonna do the documentary. <laughs> oh my goodness! You gonna be interested. But um, yeah, I was thinking um, or at least somebody who worked in the school during that time. You know, so I'm trying to get like those type of people. The social worker. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't think she will reach out. Um, and the reason why I say that. It's because a lot of the articles, like a lot of the news people, they try to contact her, and she refused to comment. You know, she, you know. You know was it back during the time, though? Was it like 15, almost 20 years ago when they tried to contact her then? Oh, yes, it was. That's a good so point. It would be worth reaching out because she might have changed. I mean, times have a way of softening things, and I people see. might want to get stuff out there, too. Because, like, you know, we don't really know. Like, the news is very biased in how they report things. Like you say they left out things you, you even thought about as we were talking, like why didn't you talk about this or approach it from this angle? So time has a way of opening up people, you know what I'm saying? Because she had probably more to lose back then than she does now. Mm. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so 20 years. Okay, years. yeah, so I'll definitely get on that and, you know, work from there. And, you know, if we were able to do that, then that's when I think we could try to reach out to the, you know, Miss Terry or Miss Farina. I'm trying to figure out which one first. I don't know. Let's do it. Just for every action, there's a reaction. That's the law of the universe, right? Yeah, but I'm just, they're not the first people first. I want to try, you know, the lawyer or the case, you know, those people, the outside, and then slowly work the way in, if that makes any sense. I don't have to make sense to me. It's like how you feel. you got to trust your intuition on it, trust your instinct. Yeah. And I'm hoping probably, I don't know, like say Farina or one of them did, it would be interesting. I'll, I'll, it would be nice if one of them could give the name of the other or just something because that's yeah. another thing. Because I don't even, and this is interesting, in the article, I don't even think they mentioned her name. They just mentioned the fact that she was on drugs. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they don't, it's like they don't want to give any type of sympathy towards the people involved in the case, the main characters. Like, that's our job as black people to understand our people are hurting. There's a reason yeah. why we're going through what we go through. But don't make them to monsters all the way. I mean, they are here yeah. too. Yeah, because I was thinking, like, because I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out if Terrell's father was Farina's um, son or was it the mother that was Farina's daughter? Because if that's if Farina uh, or if the uh, Terrell's mother was Farina's daughter, then I'm wondering what was causing the excessive drug addiction. What was she trying to escape? Because I'm wondering if Terry Lynn was abused, then say um, Terrell Peterson's mother, if that was Farina's daughter as well, was it possible that she was and she was extremely traumatized? Yeah. So that's it's another fine. thing that I would like to figure out as well. So, yeah. All righty. Well, I'll, you know, I need to get to doing my schoolwork and stuff like that. But I'm really excited to get this going. And I'm thankful that you're very open to it. It's really nice considering the work that you do. It's really important. 
No, I appreciate it. You were very important. I mean, I'm glad you reached out to me. I, I think it's interesting. <laughs> like, sometimes I just want to quit doing this stuff, and then somebody like you come along every now and then and uh, <laughs> keep me going. Yeah. I, like, I want to get out of this mess. This is too much. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but I think that you're doing a great job. Thank you so much for um, educating me and us about this case. And I look forward to having you on back on the platform very soon with some updates and things of that nature. And I also guess interview some of the people if they're open to it that was involved in Terrell Peterson's uh, unfortunate case. So you right. have any last words or you want people to follow you on social media? Like how you want to do it? Any last words? Um. Honestly, I don't, not necessarily social media, but I will say something. Um, if anyone sees this and, like, if you know anything or if you know someone who possibly could, please, like, reach out. You know what I'm saying? Like, honestly, I have an open mind. He obviously has an open mind. But I, I think I come from a standpoint of wanting to understand, you know, um, I just want to understand how something so heinous could occur, and I think you agree and honestly, you know, if there is anyone that sees this and you know something, like, please, please reach out. And, you know, like, we won't, we won't go off, we won't cuss you out or nothing like that. You know, we just want to understand. So, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Sister Angelique. I hope you be on once again very soon. In the words of Great Gilton, we love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing. All righty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Adios. Adios. And that does it for We All Be on this edition. I hope y'all learn something. I hope you feel empowered and informed. And I hope y'all do something that is very positive and constructive to the progress of not only yourself, but our beautiful people. And know once again, in the words of Duke Elgin, we love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing. One love. Everybody, this is Brother Ron. I am asking you all to do me a big favor. Think about supporting the We All Be movement. Your donation is tax deductible. The We All Be Group Incorporated is a recognized 501c3. And I'm just asking you all because I want to keep on bringing y'all quality work uh, through the way that I know how to do best. And uh, I'm going to sing my praises and toot my horn. A lot of y'all would not help to dig Gregory until Brother Ron brought him on the We All Be platform, until that Django review we did. Y'all seen another side of Judge Joe Brown, and Judge Joe Brown's message has been amplified. But it was We All Be that brought Judge Joe Brown to y'all back in 2014. And so many others. And we covered so many things. So help us out so we can help you all. Peace. <laughs>